Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's Elizabeth Minchin. I'm the Honorary Secretary of the Australian Academy of the Humanities. The, the uh, no, 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 I, I have to say something first. Um, and on behalf of the Academy of the Humanities, I acknowledge the traditional owners uh, of the land on which we're meeting uh, this evening, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. The Academy is the national body uh, of, uh, of the humanities, for the humanities in Australia. Um, and it promotes and argues for the, um, <clears throat> the contribution that the humanities, the arts and culture make to national life. Established in 1969, uh, the Academy provides independent and authoritative advice, including to government, to ensure uh, the ethical, historical, that ethical, historical and cultural perspectives inform discussion regarding the challenges that Australia faces and the opportunities that the country might seize. The Academy plays a unique role in promoting international, international engagement and collaboration and in investing in the next generation of humanities researchers and practitioners. The Academy consists of an elected body of, uh, of fellows, of scholars and leaders in 12 disciplinary fields, including four that are probably the dearest to our heart, history, classical studies, archaeology and religion. The Trendle Lecture this evening is, of course, named for Professor A.D. Trendle, Dale Trendle, a Foundation Fellow of the Academy. Professor Trendle grew up uh, and uh, took his first degree at the University of T Otago in New Zealand, and then he went uh, to the UK to further his studies. His specialised research was in Southern Italian Greek vase painting of the fifth and fourth centuries BC. And this was, this was work which he pursued for the rest of his life. Uh, and he was in fact world authority on the fabrics, the potters and the painters from that region. On returning to the Southern hemisphere, uh, Trendle made his mark as a classicist an art historian, and remarkably, a university administrator. Uh, first at Sydney University, uh, he, um, uh, he considerably enhanced the Nicholson Museum collection, while at the same time working as a senior administrator in the university. He moved from Sydney to the new university, the ANU, where he became the first master of University House and also a, a deputy vice chancellor. So he had his he had his fingers in a number of pies. From uh, while he was at the ANU, he was appointed as a foundation fellow. Uh, and inaugural chairman of the Australian Humanities Research Council, which later became the Australian Academy of the Humanities. After his retirement in 1969 and until his death, Trendle was in Melbourne, here in Melbourne, uh, where, he, um, where he was resident fellow at the then newly established La Trobe University. On his death, Trendle bequeathed a legacy to the Academy for an annual lecture, an annual lecture on, and these are his words, on some theme associated with classical studies. So the Academy is delighted once again to partner with ASKS uh, to host this, the 25th Trendle Lecture. You can, I should note, find details of past lectures on the Academy's website and 
on an edited version and an edited version of this lecture will be added to this archive in due course. So we encourage you to visit the Academy's website and to subscribe to our email newsletter so that you will be notified when this is released. And we're particularly grateful to this year's conveners, Michael and Dawn, um, uh, and congratulate them on managing a hybrid program in such splendid settings with such ease. So this brings me to the important part of my uh, introduction. On behalf of the Academy of the Humanities, I am truly delighted to welcome Dr. Emma Cole to give this the 25th Trendle Lecture. Emma completed her first degree at Sydney University, her PhD at University College London, and she was instantly snapped up, it seems to me, by the University of Bristol, uh, where she worked between 2015 and 2023, when she moved to the University of Queensland. Emma is a classicist, a theatre and performance studies scholar, a dramaturg, now this is the first time I've ever used this word in public, so I'm very pleased, a dramaturg and academic consultant on classical adaptation projects. Uh, her area of expertise lies in the performance of Greek tragedy in contemporary theatre, and her interests are in experimental, immersive, and post-dramatic adaptations of tragic texts. Emma's first book, Post Dramatic Tragedies was published by OUP in 2019. Her most recent research, supported through the Arts and Academies Research Council in the UK um, via a UKRI Innovation Fellowship titled Punch Drunk on the Classics, has now been published uh, in a book. Um, with the same with the same title and Emma will be introducing us at least to punch drunk on the classics this evening now Emma's topic for this evening is as it says up here exper experiencing immersion from antiquity to modernity so please do welcome Emma Cole Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and thank you, Dawn and Michael, as well, for the warm welcome you've given me and all the help you've given me in trying to get organised for today. Uh, I'd like to start by echoing Elizabeth's acknowledgement of country to pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional owners of these lands, and also the Yagara and Turrbal people who are the traditional owners of Mianjin, Brisbane, where I live and work. Uh, and I extend my respects to Elders past and present and any First Nations people here today. I'd like to start today with a short clip from Punch Drunk's most recent theatrical performance. This performance, my slide will connect over to the next one. Ooh. Keyboard maybe. There we go. This performance uh, is an immersive theatre production, uh, which was titled The Burnt City and played from April 2022 to September So it cut off the first two lines of the clip there, but the first lines in that video are 
this city is yours. And although it might not have been immediately obvious to you, what you just saw was Hades speaking directly to you. And if you were to enter the city that he is describing as yours, you would have then had the opportunity to tour around the streets of Troy and follow characters such as Hecuba and Polynices, both of whom were glimpsed in this trailer. Eight times a week from March 2022 to September 2023, up to 600 audience members would spend three hours plunged within this city where they could watch the fall of Troy play out on a loop three times. With no fourth wall, you could explore the set and follow the characters at will, experiencing the show as if you were Alice dropped down a rabbit hole or one of the children entering the closet and escaping into Narnia. Punch Drunk's production was an adaptation of Aeschylus' Agamemnon and Euripides' Hecuba, and it's an example of immersive theatre. Immersive theatre is a modern participatory form of performance where audiences are incorporated into the world of the show and are positioned as roaming participants whose own actions and tactile engagement with the set dictates their version of a production's narrative and its meaning. In the burnt city, this meant that a free flow promenade audience could walk around a 100,000 square foot set at will, exploring Punch Drunk's revis revisaging of both Mycenae and Troy, which as you can see in the clip here, were not historically realistic, but they're kind of Weimar inflected, touch real reimaginings. A cast of 28 characters, which included the characters from the two source tragedies, performed different scenes simultaneously, meaning that audiences would experience the narrative in something of a choose your own adventure format. So everyone would have a very vastly different experience of the show, depending on which performer they chose to follow or which rooms they entered or objects they touched. Now, immersive experiences such as the Burnt City are really big business within today's creative economy. Forms range from mm -hmm. immersive museum experiences, which Sophie Neld argues position the visitor inside an experience rather than at an exhibition, through to the forms of immersivity that are facilitated through virtual, augmented or mixed reality forms of technology. The rhetoric that surrounds all of these forms of technology on these experiences would have you believe that they're really innovative undertakings. So Punch Drunk's website, for example, features quotations which herald them as pioneers and trailblazers. But ideas of immersion are actually not a new phenomenon. Today, my aim is not to critique the claims within today's creative industries to immersivity and innovation. Indeed, as a collaborator of Punch Drunks, this will be a little bit self-defeating of me. Uh, what I do want to do, however, is to historicize the idea of immersion. Paintings, sculpture, and theater have all been theorized historically in terms of illusion, realism, and immersion. And textual critics in antiquity also theorized about literature's ability to create the sensation that a reader or a listener was present at the events being described. Punch Drunk's turn to antiquity in the burnt city was unknowingly to the company, in fact, a twofold borrowing, which was not just of the content of their show, but was also in some sense of the form. The creation of illusions that are so lifelike that an audience member, a viewer of an artwork, or a listener of a story feels as if they are bearing witness to the events being described is not just a feature of the 21st century, but was highly valued, sought after, and sometimes even a controversial idea in the ancient world as well. My talk today uh, is going to now depart a little bit from Punch Drunk, and we can come back to Punch Drunk in the questions if you like. Uh, but what I am going to do is tour you through a series of what we might call immersive experiences or prototype immersive experiences in antiquity to explore what this classical background might teach us about our preoccupations with immersion in modernity. I'm going to touch upon ideas or fascinations with immersion in both theory and practice, in theatre, epic, historiography and rhetoric, to reflect upon whether what we're seeing today is a revolution in aesthetic experience or is actually a return. There are similarities and differences between experiencing immersion in antiquity and modernity, 
but I'm going to put it to you today that there is a kinship which does invite a comparative dialogue to further our understanding of the phenomenon. So let's start with a bit of a definition. Immersive experiences, ancient and modern, can be defined as experiences which hold a couple, at least, of four characteristics. So usually within an immersive experience, we see a displacement from one's present reality. We also often see a playing with the senses. So some of the senses or all of the senses are going to be engulfed. We sometimes find the sensation of being made to feel differently or to think differently. And these two qualities are interrelated and codependent, playing upon the phenomenological and the, the cognitive. So how our bodies are feeling in the experience and how our minds are thinking. But as we're going to see throughout my examples from these four qualities, different features will come to the fore in different experiences. In each instance, the shared feature as defined by Rose Biggin is that it's not a flick between two states when we experience immersion. It's a, a graded state or a fleeting, a temporary state, which is defined by an awareness of its temporary and spatial boundaries. Now we find regular examples of these graded, fleeting, intense, and necessarily temporary states of immersion within the genre of Greek tragedy. Individual plays often feature characters that seem to be transported to an alternate reality. So we might think of Pentheus, for example, I've heard Pentheus's name a couple of times in papers today. Uh, after Dionysus costumes Pentheus ready to spy on the back end, he emerges and says, I seem to see two sons. And it's like he's been transported to an uncanny twin of Thebes. And he can no longer count upon the reliability of his sensory perception of the world. But outside of characters, there are various clues that seem to indicate that maybe even audiences in antiquity experienced immersion as well. One such example is in Aeschylus' Persians, a rare history-based play recounting the Athenian victory against Persia in a naval battle at the Bay of Salamis. And if we consider the full embodied experience, I can get to my next. There we go. The full embodied experience of witnessing the premier production of this play at the Theatre of Dionysus in 472 BCE we get a sense of how it might have facilitated immersion. So obviously this is not the theatre in 472, this is the later stone reconstruction, uh, but this is obviously where the production would have taken place. Now Aeschylus' audience would have approached this theatre up on the top of the Acropolis, where in the time when we didn't have a built up Athens, they could have looked out directly over to the Bay of Salamis. So in this uh, image, we can start to get a sense of that type of vista. So the audience would have been able to see where the events actually took place just eight years prior as they approached this theatrical experience. What we would call this today is an example of site-specific theatre, where the historical events subtly haunt the experience that spectators are undertaking. Furthermore, some of the spectators would have had first-hand experience of the events because they would have actually participated in this battle. And others would have participated in the theatrical experience in previous years. So they would have first-hand experience of performing in the theater of Dionysus. Insights from cognitive neuroscience have shown that when we have first-hand experience of something, when we later go on to watch representations of that experience, the exact same neurons fire in our brain. So for a ballerina, for example, sitting in an audience of a ballet production, the same things will happen in their brain when they watch someone else perform movements that they've mastered as what happens in their brain where they themselves actually perform those movements. So watching can feel like doing. Through this type of a view, the Persians might have facilitated an immersive experience by transporting spectators to an alternate reality. So for veterans, they might be transported back onto that battlefield that they've got firsthand experience of participating in. And for former performers within that civic chorea, they might be transported to the orchestra of the theater. The experiential connection that audiences might feel to the Persians and the site-specific location of the premiere production all encourage the boundary between representation and reality to thin. 
And this thinning of the boundary is the crucial thing here. And we can see if we compare the Persians to some other examples, how powerful it could be. So if we look at one of our other historical Greek tragedies, the sack of Miletus, which doesn't survive uh, by Phrynichus, we can see an instance where this was very controversial. So Phrynichus was fined for this play and the play was prohibited from ever being performed again because it so upset the audience. It reminded them of their past experiences in a way which was too effective. Too effective. It had to be prohibited. And of course it depicted a defeat rather than a victory. When Aeschylus does this technique for a victory, it's successful. And it continues to be successful today. So if I turn now to a modern day production of the Persians, we can see another example of this being effective. So this is a 2010 production at the National Theatre Wales, also site specific. This is in rural Wales at a military training base that was community land, farmland, compulsorily requisitioned from the community by the Ministry of Defence. And on that land was built a mock Soviet village, which was used to train the army to practice siege warfare. When the Guardian's chief theatre critic, Michael Billington, saw this production, he noted that the combination of the story and the setting is overwhelming. So here we have tensions between the Welsh and the English, uh, a body-based, a place-based connection to ideas of warfare injecting itself into the same Greek tragedy. And we find again, a very affective type of performance. So in all three examples, the audience's embodied experience and their memories shape the experience of narrative, working together to make them relive events or even feel as if they were there. The examples all buy into the component of immersion that transports someone to an alternate reality and makes one feel differently. But we don't have to turn to history-based or site-specific plays to find these potentially fleeting moments of immersivity in the Dionysia. Individual scenes from mythologically based Greek tragedies could similarly facilitate temporary states of immersion. Both messenger speeches and choral odes, for example, often push towards facilitating immersion by projecting an audience imaginatively into offstage spaces and inviting them to visualize alternate realities. Messenger speeches, for example, often draw upon what we might term inception-like strategies. So if you think of Christopher Nolan's film Inception, where people go deeper and deeper into their dream unconscious, messenger speeches operate a little bit similarly. So usually we have kind of two layers happening in a play. We've got the actual physical world you're seeing on stage and then the narrated or the dramatized events Messenger speech is at a third layer. They add an offstage narrated scene to that. And this has been termed an immersive curve of a messenger speech. Uh, and it involves the audience increasingly swapping their vision for imagination. It also often involves a dramatist invoking a sensory and a kinesthetic response from an audience, which can draw upon an audience's embodied memories of place, space, and experience. So if we turn to Euripides Andromache, for example, we have a messenger speech involving the death of Neoptolemus at Delphi, which has been described by Sarah Olson as drawing upon various forms of embodied cultural knowledge. And in the vase painting you can see on the slide here, we've got a representation which may very well be of Euripides' version within Andromache. So we've got Neoptolemus, uh, with his, it, he's been injured already, and you can see on your right hand side, Orestes crouched down, and then another assailant apparently circling him, just like what happens in the play. Now, Olsen argues that this messenger speech is noteworthy because it draws upon the landscape and architecture of Delphi, which many audience members would likely have visited themselves. And she also notes that the language of the attack draws upon the imagery of choral song dance and pyrrhic dance. So it's evoking a landscape that the audience or a portion of them would likely have been to, and then describing the attack through movements that the audience would have practiced. And this goes back to that cognitive neuroscience dimension, the phenomenon is called kinesthetic empathy, where you involuntarily feel things in your body as you hear those words being described. And Olsen argues that the messenger speech in Andromache 
involves spaces and movements that have been viscerally familiar to the audience, even linked with memories of specific sensations and embodied experiences. So here we have Euripides capitalizing upon his audience's firsthand experience and inviting them to deploy their own cultural knowledge to imagine and maybe even fleetingly become immersed in those final moments of Neoptolemus's life. Andromache demonstrates how tragedy prompts audience immersion through kinesthetic empathy so that we feel the action in our bodies whilst listening to the speech. If we turn to Seven Against Thebes, we can see an example of how this might work in a choral ode. And again, here we've got a scene, potentially a scene directly from the play uh, being depicted on a vase at one of the seven gates of Thebes. Now, the Seven Against Thebes example is really interesting because we've got quotations which seem to imply that it might have even been immersive or thought of as immersive even in antiquity. So we have a quote from Athenaeus who quotes from an earlier author, Aristocles, who describes how one of Aeschylus' original dancers, Telestes, made manifest the events of the plot through dance. So how he conjured an alternate reality to appear before the audience's eyes. The device of a choral projection transports an audience into a different temporal and spatial world to where the other action of a tragedy takes place effectively pausing the plot of a tragedy to provide background narrative or a comparative example. Projections combine the ability for tragic language to invite audiences to direct their attention to different spatialities, so what we saw in a messenger speech, with intermedial danced narrative. So the audience here is invited not only to imagine an alternate world, but also to witness it. Laura Gianvittorio Unger notes that Telestes might have performed this solo martial dance during the chorus's war report, where he might have been fully armoured and potentially handling weapons that are typical of war dancers. Such a weapons dance, she argues, would powerfully enhance the experiential and immersive quality of the war narrative by engaging the senses of the spectators and by evoking real life experiences. The fact that Gorgias and Aristophanes both described the drama as full of Aries and as leaving any man who saw it with a craving for fighting implies that even though this scene visualised the offstage action rather than prompting the audience to imagine it, it still might have facilitated fleeting immersion as by encouraging a hunger for war, it's making those spectators feel differently. Now, the way that speech and song might cue an audience in the ancient theatre into visualising an alternate complex reality is obviously very, very different to the type of immersion that happens in a production like Punch Drunk's Burnt City, or indeed the type of immersion that might happen if you put on a virtual reality headset. So there's a difference in directionality in the two experiences. In the modern world, we are stepping into an alternate reality well, in the ancient theatre, the imagined world is entering our present reality. So language and performance are rendering an alternate reality like an apparition that's going to flash before our eyes. Well, Punch Drunk's form of immersion is interactive. In my examples from Greek tragedy, we have a much more passive audience. And uh, that's a kind of controversial term. Obviously, bodies and minds are working together to create the affect in the ancient examples. But we obviously don't have the same kind of mobile audience opening doors and drawers and touching performers here. Uh, however, despite all of these differences, if we look at how these different phenomena are theorized, we see that despite the difference in directionality, the effect of such experiences was understood in quite similar ways. The ancient Greeks had several technical terms for experiences that to varying degrees can be thought of as mapping on to modern ideas of immersion. So mimesis, for example, is usually translated as representation or imitation. And in Aristotle's poetics, it's that quality of drama that should represent real life. So not just persons, but action and reality. So the centrality of mimesis to Aristotle's understanding of drama shows that even in antiquity, people were interested in that relationship between reality and its representation. And not just interested, but worried. In Plato's hands, mimesis becomes a really controversial and dangerous concept 
which could facilitate instances where a theatre audience might find themselves unable to distinguish between appearance and reality. So mimesis brings to the fore for us that quality of an immersive experience that encourages someone to think differently. In book three of The Republic, for example, Plato cautions against poets alighting their voice and creating the appearance of an unmediated, unmediated narrative unfolding in real time, arguing that it can create a close identification, a troublingly close identification between listener and character. The danger of this identification is that it can potentially have a corrupting effect upon the soul, particularly if the character is depicted as engaging in a moral behaviour. And in book 10, Plato flags painters and tragedians as particularly dangerous, as they're imitators not of reality, but of the representations of reality that others manufacture. And I always, when I think about this, I think back to my own childhood. Uh, when I was growing up in the 90s, my parents banned me from watching Home and Away. And the justification for this banning was that it was giving me unrealistic expectations for life. Uh, and by this, what they meant is they worried that uh, the soap opera stakes, I wouldn't be able to distinguish as part of a genre. And I would think that the kind of melodrama with which those characters greeted every single situation was going to influence my behavior. And that I was going to start reacting in a really extreme way every time they told me to do something or not to do something. Um, the fact that I now work in a drama department means maybe they had reason for this. Uh, mimetic art for Plato can absorb a viewer or a listener so completely that they become unable to distinguish how far it is removed from real behavior. And it can encourage such close affiliation with a character as to influence one's habits and shape their soul. All of this indicates that Plato understood mimesis in a way similar to how today's artists understand immersion as a mechanism through which someone can conjure a hyper-realistic alternate reality. While for Plato, these qualities are really dangerous, for artists like Punch Drunk, they're the ideal. Felix Barrett, who is the artistic director of Punch Drunk, and he was also co-director of The Burnt City, argues that his work stands in opposition to rational cognitive processing and is instead, and I quote, about engaging the other side of our brains, the adrenaline fueled fight or flight heightened state, end quote. His overall goal when directing immersive theater is to build a parallel universe. For a few hours inside the walls, you forget that it's London and slip into this other place. Plato's worst nightmare perhaps, but a really vital part of today's creative economy nonetheless. Although Plato's consideration of mimesis focuses upon the dangers it represents to humanity, many others in antiquity celebrated those techniques that seemingly drew viewers, listeners, and later readers in. The examples that I cited before from Aeschylus and Euripides were not anomalies, but were part of a much bigger picture. Critics later in antiquity, for example, recognized and championed the power of narrative to overwhelm the senses and praised effective instances of the phenomenon, often through terms such as ekphrasis and enageia. So in thinking of ekphrasis, we often think of a, a textual description of a visual object, something like the shield of Achilles, but it has a much wider original definition. Uh, it's defined as something that which brings its subject before the eyes or makes listeners into spectators. Ruth Webb notes that an ekphrasis was a technique used, for example, to make the audience feel involved in the subject matter, to make them feel as if they were at the scene of a crime or that they themselves witnessed the achievements for which an emperor is being praised. Enageia, which means vividness, is defined quite similarly to ekphrasis by Dionysius of Halicarnassus as the power of bringing the things that are said before the senses of the audience and enabling the audience to feel as if they can see the actions going on and that they are meeting face to face the characters in an orator's story. An Argea represents the component of an ekphrasis that could affect a listener emotionally. For Quintilian, it has a time warping function and could make someone feel transported to either the past or to a hypothetical future. According to Webb, an Argea is a tool of persuasion, which when combined with corresponding arguments could change the mental disposition of a listener 
and encourage them to believe a speaker's story is the truth. So whereas ekphrasis refers to a type of language which encourages imagined projections, enageia denotes how or the degree to which a reader or a listener might feel immersed within those projections. And consequently, it's enageia that I'm going to discuss in a little more depth today. Enargaic passages can be found in all different types of ancient literature. And for the second half of today's lecture, I want to introduce you to three passages which were all historically described as enargaic, and thus we might like to think as, in a sense, immersive. Looking at these three examples whilst keeping modern immersive experiences in mind, despite their differences, demonstrates that synergy between the ancient and the modern, how one is often being invited to have that displacement from reality, have their senses engulfed and maybe invited to think differently or to feel differently. For my first example, I'm going to take you right back to Homer's Iliad, to the description of Patroclus's funeral games and the horse race that happens in book 23. An anonymous ancient scholiast described this passage as being projected so vividly, so with so much enargeia, that the readers are no less captivated than the spectators. And the passage in question uh, starts off in Emily Wilson's translation as follows. All of them raised their whips above the horses and struck them with the reins and shouted, go. Swiftly the horses raced across the plain and soon the ships were far behind. The dust flew up and gathered underneath their chests like clouds or like a whirlwind and their manes trailed off in the gusts of air. The chariots bounced and sometimes rested on the fertile earth and sometimes hurtled up into the air. The heart of every man was thumping fast and all of them were hoping they would win. All of them urged their horses ever onward. They flew and raised the dust across the plain. Now, a narratological analysis of how this passage facilitates immersion would focus on the presence of certain linguistic strategies, which create a multi-sensorial narration of bodily movement and the fixed temporal sequence of events, uh, which all combine to help a listener see the episode. So we might include within this, for example, the dust rising against the horse's chest, their manes flowing in the wind, the chariot skimming close to the earth and flying midair, feeling of hearts beating, the sound of a cacophony of shouts, things like that. Time here on the one hand stands still, the moment before the, uh, the whips are raised and striking the horse. And at the other, on the other hand, it also speeds up with its elasticity, helping the reader or the listener, listener to visualize the scene. It's allowing us to combine contrasting bits of information uh, and create that kind of multi-dimensional sense of experience. And the narration of bodily movement here and the pacing all work together to allow us to combine slices of experience together and kind of weave it together to project the whole in our mind's eye. Yet other moments of the rest of the chariot race also vividly zoom into the event in such a way as to make one feel like they're witnessing it. So as the race builds momentum, a dispute arises between two of the charioteers Antilochus and Menelaus, uh, who come second and third in the race, respectively. And we have Menelaus beaten. Uh, his opponent veers off track to overtake him, forcing Menelaus to slow his horses to avoid a collision. And then later on, before the conclusion of the race, we have the narrator switching perspectives, moving from the perspective of the charioteers to the audience. And we get, uh, in particular, insight from Adomineus and Ajax, who are watching the race, uh, and we see or we experience the event from their perspective, waiting to see who's going to be in the lead. So we get positioned as watching the original audience watching the race. We get a fixed vantage point from which to imagine what's happening, which aids in our absorption of the scene. It delays our knowledge of the outcome, so it's building dramatic tension, and it allows us to experience a moment of victory together with the Domineus and Ajax. Although narratologists would focus on how these linguistic features foster immersion, if we situate this passage within the history of immersivity across time and across genre, outside of literary narrative and up till modernity, we might be reminded that whilst these words are vividly describing a narrative, it's highly likely that this vividness was exacerbated by the embodied materiality of performance 
and the psychological suspension of disbelief that's facilitated by a rhapsode narrating the passage, varying their voice to convey different characters and to build dramatic tension. The temporary facilitation of immersion through the Enargaic passage recalls how we might experience fleetingly immersion in other modern day experiences. So not every moment of the passage will necessarily immerse the reader or the listener, but rather individual moments of theatricality will attempt to stimulate a graded experience of immersion. For a counterexample, I'm going to zoom forward a few centuries and shift genre from epic to historiography to land on Thucydides' fifth century narration of the Peloponnesian War. Like Homer's Iliad, Thucydides' history has been described or analysed as containing this quality of Anagea since antiquity. Plutarch, for example, claims that Thucydides is always striving for Anagea in his writing, since it is, it is his desire to make the reader a spectator, as it were, and to produce vividly in the minds of those who peruse his narrative the emotions of amazement and consternation which were experienced by those who beheld them. Plutarch's key example is Thucydides' narration of the doomed Sicilian expedition in Book 7, and in particular his decision to narrate the Athenians' defeat at Syracuse from the perspective of the spectators watching from the shore. Now we've already seen via the Persians and the sack of Miletus how immersion could be a particularly effective technique within a military history, and this continues through to today. So a film like Dunkirk, for example, is regularly described as being an immersive piece of cinema. Within Thucydides, Enagea is deployed to encourage strong emotional identification with the story world, allowing readers to evoke an image in their mind's eye and experience an embodied connection with the imagined situation. The power of Thucydides' passage lies in its placement within the wider narrative at a dramatic moment within the overall Peloponnesian War. Thucydides starts by narrating the significance of the moment where everything hangs in the balance before going on to describe the battle from the perspective of the two armies. So we get both perspectives uh, from the armies as embedded spectators. This gives us a multiplicity of viewpoints. He builds dramatic tension. So he goes on to note how the Athenians fears for the future were like nothing they had ever experienced. And he explicitly draws attention to the fact that not all of the spectators were looking in the same direction at once. So he's further bifurcating the reactions of those present. So we've got two armies and then lots of contrasting responses within the armies. The passage evokes a cacophony of noises with the inclusion of sounds and haptic sensations, ensuring that the passage goes beyond the visual. So Thucydides writes, for example, that while the battle, while the result of the battle was still in doubt, one could hear sounds of all kinds coming at the same time from this one Athenian army. Lamentations and cheering, cries of we are winning and of we are losing, and all the other different exclamations bound to be made by a great army in its great danger. So overall, we witness here the action from the sidelines as multi-sensorial performed action. Andrew Walker argues that the passage contains a poetics of realism with the implicit goal of an aesthetics of illusion, where the author produces representations that are so like the originals that they become indistinguishable from reality. So the reader here is invited to imagine an event in such vividness that they seem to experience it from a variety of constructed specific perspectives. So in other words, the idea is that you experience a narrative in such a way that you feel as if you might be living it. Although we don't have the embodied materiality of performance in this example, if we put it in dialogue with those modern immersive experiences, then the theatricality of Thucydides employing embedded spectators becomes pronounced. Like the chariot race sequence, we witness this episode from the sidelines as performed action. And crucially, we're invited to see the experience or see the sequence through a range of different perspectives. Both Homer and Thucydides' use of Enagea and their possible facilitation of what we might term an immersive or a, a proto-immersive experience involve more specifically literary strategies than mimesis, but they're working quite similarly here to blur illusion and reality, 
by making one see an alternate reality and by persuading one to think and to feel differently. Before I move to conclude this talk, I want to share one final example, moving from historiography to oratory and the work of Lysias, one of the 10 Attic orators. In particular, I want to touch upon one of Lysias's fifth century homicide defense speeches, uh, known as Lysias I, uh, which again features prose that was characterized even in antiquity as anarchaic. Dionysius of Halicarnassus argued that Lysias's speeches possessed anarchaea in abundance, which Dionysius claims was achieved through Lysias conveying the things he is describing to the senses of his audience and via his grasp of circumstantial detail. So Dionysius argues, and I'm going to quote here, that nobody who applies their mind to the speeches of Lysias will be so obtuse, insensitive, or slow-witted that they will not feel that they can see the actions which are being described going on and that they are meeting face-to-face -face the characters of the orator's story. Lysias I consists of a speech that's written for a defendant named Euphiletus, and Euphiletus is charged with the crime of murdering his wife's lover, Eratosthenes. And the premise of this speech is really quite simple, with Euphiletus arguing that the murder was justifiable homicide because he's behaving within the law. However, the strategies that Euphiletus employs here to make his case and to attempt to persuade the jury are not what you might expect. So whereas Homer and Thucydides employed the technique of Enargea to build dramatic tension and to craft a powerful, affective narrative, Lysias's speech for Euphiletus uses the technique for a much higher stakes purpose. By immersing the jury within Euphiletus's version of events, he makes the jurors feel as if they were first person witnesses to his version of the crime. Euphiletus's defense is that the murder was justified as he caught Eratosthenes having sex with his wife and the murder happens then. Uh, so the fact that it's not premeditated is the key defense here. The speech, however, doesn't mention the defense until the final paragraph, right before the laws are read and witnesses are called. It seems like a bit of an odd strategy. Instead, what we have is a speech that is almost entirely devoted to a vivid description of Euphiletus's marriage rather than the charge at hand. And he commences with a portrait of the early days, the happy days of his marriage. And then he goes on to detail what happened after the birth of his first child, how his wife and he commenced separate sleeping arrangements so that he could, or she could rather, she could breastfeed the child on demand throughout the night. And you get my drift about this kind of seemingly unnecessary detail that's being provided here. It's got nothing to do with the murder. Uh, Euphiletus goes on to narrate all these other details about uh, things which are kind of odd, like his wife locking the upstairs doors or downstairs doors creaking at night, his wife doing her makeup differently, things like that. And later on, when Euphiletus gets a tip off from someone else saying, I think you need to keep a close eye on your wife, he goes back over this kind of breadcrumb trail of events that's turning them over in his mind uh, and becoming more suspicious. On the night of the crime, we learn spatial details of the house. So we're seeing anarchaic techniques deployed again. We learn the architectural layout of the house. We learn the precise angle that a door has been left ajar. Uh, we get a description by a fixed temporal sequence of the specific events that lead up to the crime. So Euphiletus being alerted to an intruder in the house, him going outside to gather witnesses, him catching Euph uh, Eratosthenes in the act, uh, Eratosthenes offering him money, so a kind of admission of guilt through offering to pay money, and then the crime at hand. So overall, this speech works to convince the jurors that Euphiletus acted within the law through an emotional appeal via a vivid representation of his domestic life, complete with rich characterization and directly quoted speech. By making the jury feel as if they are first person witnesses to the marriage and the crime, Lysias's speech tries to stop, stop them from imagining that the crime could have taken place in any other way. Although Plato sees the danger of immersion as associated with representations created by painters or tragedians, Lysias I shows how deceptive immersivity can be in other realms, such as in politics or within the law courts. As in these arenas, using language to transport listeners to an alternate reality, or even tricking listeners into believing a false reality,
can have life or death consequences. And our Gaia here is as much an aesthetic experience as it is a literary feature. And its affective potential to change one's mental disposition is integral. In the examples that I've toured you through today, we've seen how even in antiquity, the power of plunging audiences, listeners, readers, and juries into an alternate reality was well understood. These last three examples were all noted, even in antiquity, as being arresting aesthetic experiences. Theatrical experiences within the theatre of Dionysus that blurred the line between reality and its representation were considered by critics in the ancient world as more powerful and maybe even more dangerous than the theatre in general. While moments within epic and historiography, which seemed to bring myth or bring history to life, stood out as noteworthy for their ability to make us feel as if we were there. In the law courts, rhetoricians latched on to exactly what Plato cautions against. So the power of rhetoric to immerse a jury and shape their mind towards a desired outcome, irrespective of the relation that that outcome holds to the facts. And the fact that the effect that was or that is prized by creators of immersive experiences today is so central to so many texts in the ancient world, I think makes it no surprise really that so many modern day experiences turn back to antiquity. So maybe there's something in these texts or this, uh, this particular time period which makes them ripe for realisation within the immersive economy. So put a range of examples on the slides here. You might like to think of the Pergamon Museum in Berlin and the um, 360 experience that was crafted there for several years, uh, video games like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and then, of course, the theatre experiences by Punch Drunk or by other theatre companies like Zoo UK, Shunt, uh, and Dream Think Speak, all of which have done classical receptions. I've stressed today how we see a difference in directionality between immersion in antiquity and modernity, whereby in antiquity, the imagined world enters the present day as an apparition, while in modernity, we step into an alternate reality. Despite these differences, both experiences are, I think, in synergy. Conceptually, the type of immersion invited through vivid descriptions in antiquity and the embodied materiality of modern participatory performance is related in that both require an imaginative leap of faith for an immersant to experience a reality outside of their own. A literary description requires a reader or a listener's cooperation in imagining and becoming immersed in a narrative. And similarly, a theatre experience requires a suspension of disbelief for a spectator to feel part of and become immersed within a performance. But the kinship between immersion, ancient and modern, is not just limited to that type of buy-in that's required from an immersant. It also includes what we might deem to be the function of the immersive experience and the benefits and the dangers that arise through the experience. The dangers of immersion today are usually detailed with respect to the ethics of those experiences or with respect specifically to virtual reality. Uh, and the psychological effects that scientists have cited in relation to the technology, uh, which can go from seasickness right through to kind of hallucination, addiction and dissociation. By putting immersion, ancient and modern, into dialogue, we might be reminded of the wider risks that are associated with immersivity. So how feeling like you're a first person witness to something that was really just an illusion can shape the mind and warp your perception of reality. Yet by putting the two experiences into dialogue, we learn other things too. Immersion, for example, we've learned doesn't need complex technology or a big budget. Uh, but actually, to be displaced from our present reality, to have our senses engulfed, or to be made to feel differently and to think differently, can all be achieved simply through narrative. We also learn that just as resisting an immersive curve in Greek tragedy might be futile. So, Thinking back to those cognitive neuroscientists and kinesthetic empathy, if the right neurons are firing in our brain, we're going to have no help but to feel like we're there. Uh, so too, might it be futile to resist the immersive turn in today's creative industries. The preoccupation with feeling like one has first person experience of a time, place or story is a trans historical urge. Looking to the classics historicizes today's immersive experiences 
and showcases how these forms of experience are perhaps not as innovative as first appears, but rather a part of a rich tradition that goes right back to antiquity. Thank you. Well, uh, this has been an amazing, an amazing talk, um, taking us from the ancient world, taking us back from the modern world into the ancient world and bringing us forward again. Um, are there questions for Emma? <laughs> yes, when I, here's one over here, Bob, and then <laughs> Catherine. <laughs> ah, and then Ko. <laughs> Oh, thanks so much, Emma. Wonderful as ever. Um, I was I was wondering about the the relationship of immersion, immersion and a sort of meta theatrical defamiliarization, the the sort of thing we get in Aristophanes. Because on, on the one hand, I can see that it's absolutely antithetical that if you if the actor is saying this isn't a real giant dung beetle, it's being operated by this crane operator there, then that's sort of um, stopping the the whole immersive leap and uh, suspension of disbelief. But at the same time, I wondered whether um, if you're imagining that you're both um, in the, the audience of the Great Dionysia and you're sitting with Dicaiopolis in the, in the assembly or that the, the women of the Thesmophoria are searching around um, to find men in the Thesmophorion, this sort of blurring of performance and performed reality. And, and so I just wondered, is, is there sometimes this sort of duality? I mean, even in Punch Drunk, I mean, are people just imagining that they are in um, sort of Dark Ages Troy, or are they imagining they're in Dark Ages Troy, and they're also actors in a punch drunk immersive performance at the same time, rather than separating them off completely? Uh, lots we can unpack there. To start with the end, so to start with punch drunk, the way in which you're immersed within that production or punch drunk's aim is not to so much make you feel that you're in Troy, but that the connections that you're having within that performance are real. So when, uh, if I go back to my first slide, we've got a beautiful picture of the performer Morgan who's playing Apollo there and he's staring directly at the camera and punch drunk do direct eye contact and they do uh, what are called one-on-one -on -one scenes where they will take an audience member off and perform a scene just for them alone and the kind of collapsing of reality and its representation in the punch drunk show is that you might feel like the beat of intimacy that you have with a performer is real, that it's not scripted, that they see you or that they hold your hand for a moment. So it's a different type of collapsing there where it's not like um, maybe virtual reality where you might feel physically in that landscape. With this, people remain, they retain that awareness that it's like walking through a film set, that the alternate reality in which their body is in is kind of yeah, it's a, um, a representation, but they're trying to create the blurring in a different way. Um, the example that you mentioned from comedy, I suppose my kind of way that I organise things in my head is I almost see that those two competing discourses and we might think of um, the example where you can see the operator and that kind of breaking of immersivity being an alternate theatre trajectory that goes kind of through to Brecht and uh, practitioners who deliberately, I suppose the more pro-Plato pro practitioners who deliberately don't want you to have that identification and who are trying to have that defamiliarization experience within the theatre. So I think it's not something that people inevitably want throughout time. There's a, a cluster of artists who that's their end goal uh, and different audience members will have different experiences. Not everyone's going to be immersed, but it might it might work for one person. It might work for no, none, but we have the strategy employed nonetheless. And then other practitioners who are actually actively trying to stop that from happening. Thanks. I'll pass on to Catherine. Thanks, Emma. It was really interesting. I enjoyed it a lot. So you've mentioned drama and oratory and historiography. I wonder if you've got or you would like to make any comment on ritual um, because, I mean, working with Alina, for example, on the Temple of Fortuna Prim Prim Primogenia, you, you're going through passageways and alleys and, you know, she was showing how that, that, that messed with your head. And I'm thinking also of Tatiana Burr and the mechanical 
the great snail. She can't give a paper without the great snail. It has to be there every time. So these mechanisms, a bit like your scarab beetle, but they're in a religious setting, which of course the theatre was. So I'm just wondering if the architecture and decision making, you know, the mystery cults and all the rest of them aren't another beautiful example ready and waiting for this kind of histo historiographical or historical excursion you've taken us on. <laughs> So they definitely are. Good. Um, and I, in my book, in the, the final chapter of Punch Drunk on the Classics, I talk about this kind of stuff, the relationship between what Punch Drunk are doing and immersion in antiquity. And I have a section where I talk about the city Dionysia as a kind of ritual experience and how um, not just within individual performances, but actually thinking about the, the pomp, the procession as a kind of buffer zone um, can map on to ideas of immersive experiences today as well. So there's a bit in my book where I talk about the, the kind of ritual of the city Dionysia and the events there, but there's a lot more that you can do there um, as well as the examples you brought up at Bristol. Um, one of my colleagues, Esther Eden, how or former colleagues when I was at Bristol did a project on, it was called the virtual reality Oracle about the Oracle at Dodona. And they were interested in the kind of immersivity of consulting an Oracle. They, um, Esther and Richard Cole, no relation. Um, and they, cre they created an experience there. Punch Drunk, interestingly, uh, to go on a slight tangent, you entered the burnt city by um, through, they called it a crossfade, the kind of experience you went through. And it um, was inspired by the Eleusinian mysteries. And um, Felix, one of the co-directors, was very, very interested in, um, you know, the, the little hints that we have about going from darkness to a blazing light and things like that. So he was trying to kind of incorporate no audience member would know, but incorporate little things from that as part of this opening. Yeah, so lots, lots there. You could do another book on that one. Good. I hope you do. <laughs> Emma, thank you so much. I have a comment which amounts to validation and then a question. <laughs> the comment is, I'm very impressed that the three texts that you chose to illustrate ancient and Argea are the same texts that often get used to teach ancient Greek to students at the university level. So I have taught Lysias I for third semester Greek, Homer for fourth semester Greek, Thucydides for sixth semester Greek. And I, I suspect those are the texts which our students like to read because they are immersive. Mm. They really, they react to them in a different way because it catches their imagination. My question is following up what you said at the end about ancient and modern understandings of immersion being in dialogue with each other. And in your work on modern immersive productions of Greek drama specifically, do you find that there are ancient Greek theatrical conventions or performance practices which modern audiences find distancing or off-putting or difficult to deal with that they tend to throw away or discard when they do their immersive um, uh, reception of those? of ancient drama? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So often you find the chorus goes. Uh, that's the first thing that gets cut. Uh, and the example that we've got on the bottom of the slide here um, from Punch Drunk's The House of Oedipus, uh, this is a production where they hadn't fully kind of got to grips with how to do these productions. So it was based on um, Oedipus, Tyrannus and Antigone from memory. I didn't say that one, it's from 2000. So pre my time working with the company. Um, but that was a production where I don't think they had cut the chorus at that point and they'd kept the text of the tragedies. And by the time you get to the Burnt City, uh, they've cut the chorus. So their understanding is that the audience is the chorus uh, and the audience are actually masked in a punch drunk show as well. So that's how you can kind of tell who's a performer and who's an audience member. Um, the performers are unmasked and the audiences are masked. So they're a masked collective uh, and they've largely disbanded with text as well. And so they've translated the text into movement. And that means big cuts, uh, but it's primarily told through a kind of dance narrative, which you saw a little bit of the aesthetic in the clip. And often they worked very, very closely with the text. So they would have kind of specific 
bits of dialogue. Uh, so when um, Agamemnon returns uh, to Mycenae and his first encounter with Clytemestra, they were working with the text and kind of trying to get the beats down into dance. Uh, so they're, they're engaging with the text, but they're not saying the words. And they found that in the earlier productions, when they staged the text, in that kind of participatory performance, it lost the audience. So they had to kind of distill it down, which is fascinating. Thanks, Emma. It's it's such amazing stuff. And yeah, I'm, I'm so glad, you know, you're you're getting a lot of props for it because it, it's incredible. Um, yeah, I had a question, you know, I, I guess I tend to uh, explain a lot of modernity by, uh, recourse to uh techno capitalism and what it does to us uh and so i, I was wanting to ask you about the, this sort of you know the the desire for immersivity the desire for immersion you know in 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 some ways i can see why we want it now because you know we spend so much of our lives dissociated numb you know basically on our phones uh and you know th this made me think you know <laughs> what was the audience reaction to to punch drunk like was it uniformly positive or is it you know th th this fact that we kind of spend our lives most of our lives numb does it actually like make us ill-equipped to, to deal with this kind of immersion nowadays interesting so for the burnt city i mean it, it wasn't uniformly positive we were very fortunate that critically it was a real success we only had one two-star review, no one-star reviews, but one two-star review, which I think was in the Telegraph, uh, where the critic said he felt like there was a great party going on, but he could never find it. That was his experience of the performance, just kind of getting lost. Uh, within the audiences, so the capacity was 600 per show. So it was huge, huge numbers. And uh, I'm sure there are people out there. I mean, my parents didn't like it. They came and saw it and they said um, something along the lines of we can we can respect it, but it's not for us, not our cup of tea. My mum really disliked the fact she had to cloak her bag. She wasn't expecting the fact that it's a very small handbag. Why do I have to cloak my small handbag? But they have people um, stealing things from the set. So they have absolutely no bags allowed because it's such an amazing labyrinthine set and the design. It is like being on a film set. So people, um, so that's kind of the issue that we have actually. It's not an unwillingness to fall into the world, but actually because it's a new way of engaging with theatre, it's establishing the rules and doing so in a way where stipulating rules and boundaries doesn't actually act as a barrier to the experience. That's the tension. And the performers, not in this production, but in another punch drunk show, Sleep No More, which was on, it's still on actually in New York and Shanghai. There was a BuzzFeed expose, I think in about 2018, where performers went on record saying that they'd been assaulted in the show because it's very dark. There's obviously so much space, so many little nooks and crannies in the set. And in New York, they were having, I think it was like a 7 p.m. show and then an 11 p.m. show. And they would have audiences who'd um, been out partying, coming to the 11. So it went for three hours. So it was 11 p.m. till 2 a.m. And you can just kind of imagine what's happening when you have this setup where there's no fourth wall. You can seemingly do anything, follow anyone, go anywhere in the set. So They've gotten much better at that by the time of the Burnt City. They'd learned a lot from the States and had um, a kind of code system for um, there were lots of stage managers around in black masks and they could say a word if they were worried about an audience member behaving in a certain way. There were cameras and things like that around. But, yeah, that was the tightrope they were walking, how to kind of stipulate the rules. You can touch things, but you can't take anything home. You can't touch a performer unless they touch you first and I say touch you know sometimes they might take your hand and lead you somewhere something like that um but yeah that's that was the difficulty rather than getting someone to concentrate for three hours without their phone people were willing to do that actually thank you so much it was really fascinating stuff um, so 
just I wanted to drill in a little bit to the ethical implications that you mentioned mm. because where I have read about this in particular is around the museum sector where it is about immersion in terrible events from antiquity mm. which of course we're getting here just like through uh, um, well you know events like tricky but um I guess two things here. One is you are always going to be immersed in a particular viewpoint about what's happening. The other thing is that there is kind of a concern that I've read about sort of victim tourism in the idea that you are essentially immersing and having a very potentially kind of superficial adrenaline-based um, experience, like a jump scare experience almost of something that was a truly terrible historical event. And I, I'm sure you've thought about these things, so I'd really like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so I mean, like like any form of art, there are good and bad examples of immersive experiences today. And there are people that take their duty of care to the audience members, the attendees at an exhibition very, very seriously. And then there are those that don't at all. And there's an immersive theatre production, nothing to do with the classics, and I haven't seen it yet, so I can't give it its due regard, but um, by a Brisbane-based company called Counterpilot, which is kind of touring around at the moment. Uh, and I think it's called Truth Machine, Truth Teller, something like that. And it has generated a lot of controversy because it puts audience members in lie detectors and doesn't kind of tell them what the contract for performance is going to be before they get in there. And then, you know, they're at a theatre experience potentially with their partner and are put in this very vulnerable position. So it is something which I know there is a lot of journalism being generated. I'm more um, cued in to the theatre side rather than the museum side, but there is a lot of journalism being generated and people thinking deeply about it. And there is no kind of set of guidelines for the immersive experience economy. And given that it's such a buzzword, it's something where there really does need to be some type of work put in because everything is being described as immersive these days as an immersive bluey world opening in Brisbane later this year so it's something that yes I'm thinking about that I know other people are thinking about but that translation from academy to industry isn't quite happening yet so yeah you're, you're right to raise it as an important area Hey, thank you so much for that talk. It was excellent. Um, I have a question uh, sort of partly just from curiosity. Now, I'm not as familiar with theatre as I'd, I'd like to be, uh, but it seems a lot of the examples of immersive theatre you sort of brought up, uh, sort of punch drunk and sort of VR and things like that, uh, create sort of immersiveness through being sort of closed off through a controlled environment. Uh, but it's also sort of following from what Catherine mentioned earlier uh, is that in a lot of like religious experiences, uh, a lot of sanctuaries involved the surrounding landscape and sort of outdoor spaces to create like immersiveness and sort of empathize themes and things like that. I was just curious if you've looked into this and also in general, uh, does modern theater make use of sort of more outdoor open landscapes, things like that to sort of foster immersiveness at all? Absolutely. So the image that you can see up the top uh, is at the British Museum. And this is a production that I worked on with Punch Drunk called Cabayroy. Uh, and this was a four to six hour experience that took place on the streets of London. Uh, and when I, so I, I worked on it and then I also got to experience it. It was for two audience members at a time. Uh, and my, um, I think it was a Fitbit at that stage. It wasn't an Apple Watch in 2017. I, I did 14,000 steps. So it was a four to six hour experience and it kind of took you all over London. And the original aim was actually uh, to take you from the city to the country. They ended up losing a venue in the country. So it was kind of from the city to the outskirts of London in Tottenham Hale, not quite the same, but a similar type of movement. And I've written a journal article for the um, International Journal of the Classical Tradition, I think is the um, full title, on Kebeiroi. And what Punch Drunk sought to do in that was to um, blur the lines. So I, I talked about the blurring the line between reality and its representation in the paper. And they were trying to kind of make you feel immersed 
just in reality. So make you not be able to trust what was performance and what was real world. So they were manipulating. You started off with headphones in that performance. So it was closed off and controlled. You had an audio soundtrack. Uh, and then it was structured in three parts. When you got to the British Museum, you lost your headset and you were kind of free. And you, it was a bit like a scavenger hunt kind of thing. You had cards and there were performers hidden around the place. And uh, so that was all about the surrounding and the location. Uh, there's There are people who are working on um, immersiveness in landscapes. Uh, I can get you some references afterwards. I've got an edited collection coming up, which is on antiquity and immersivity. And so there are people who are interested in kind of yeah, theatrical locations as immersive spaces. The difficulty that I see often is that you bring in so many uncontrollables which can rupture that sense of immersion once you move outdoors so it can be great and it can kind of fully extend the boundaries of the experience and be much more kind of totalizing when you know you're not in a closed set you feel a sense of protection when you're actually in a physical performance space because you kind of think okay no matter how what's going on I should be looked after by the performers often um, not often but there are exceptions to that rule I mean the example before about kind of jump scare horror type things um side alley things are an exception to that but you should be there should be a duty of care in place when you're on the, the streets or in an outdoor location you don't necessarily have all of those protections in place and then you have things which are innocent like inclement weather and whatnot which could completely come and rupture the experience so I think there's benefits and shortcomings or dangers in the approach but yeah I have I have one piece on modern non-enclosed immersive experiences that's right seems that um, immersion in immersivity in literature is extremely tame in comparison <laughs> with the the kinds of events you're depicting here are there more questions? Is there anyone else who wants? Yes, there is indeed. Thank you uh, very much. Fascinating. Um, really great to see this done with classics. A couple of years ago in Melbourne, the Malt House had a, a, an immersive production, which was a telling of Hamlet. Mm -hmm. We had to wear creepy rabbit masks. It was <laughs> very upsetting, but it was great. Um, and at that moment, it was totally, my experience of it at least, was totally unlike when I've gone to the theater in other contexts. And yet it seems that what you've argued uh, in this lecture is that it's kind of immersion all the way down. And I wonder if you could expand on the qualitative differences in the kinds of immersivity that are being suggested by telling a really good story very vividly, by hearing a speech, by seeing a play, or by actually being in the play in a way that these kind of immersive productions is are they talking about a different kind of immersion than what a really anarchic speech might be trying to create? Uh, does that make sense as a question? Yes, and I think that my short answer would be that yes, they are talking about something that is fundamentally different, but it's the effect that's the same. So the, the means through which you feel immersed whether that's in an imagined projection, whether you're a jury member listening to a speech and feel like you're there or you're a theatre theater attendee walking around a set, on the surface, they're completely different. But I think that what you go home with when you kind of think back on that memory, I think they're in maybe not the same, but in kinship is how I would. So my hunch is kind of thinking, I don't rely heavily on the neuroscientist um, stuff that's not my area of specialism but the idea that you've got these lines in plays where they're narrating movement and it's making your brain feel as if you were performing it and when you think back on that memory it would be kind of obviously not indistinguishable from performing it you knew you witnessed it but you would have that kind of embodied response to it I think that that carries through across genre so if you have a speech in a law court, when you think back over it, trying to work out innocence or guilt, that kind of feeling as if you were there when you can imagine when you're playing over it in your mind, I think is the same if you're thinking back over the experience of physically being in a theatrical production. 
I don't know if that quite answers your your question. So it's both and, I guess. I think the, the means through which it's achieved is totally different, but there's a kinship in the effect in the aftermath of the experience. May I ask a question? Is that <laughs> sorry? Um, I was really intrigued early on in your talk when you gave the example of a ballerina watching mm. and I was and also about um, audience members in an ancient production watching the chorus and I think this goes back to the first question as well and thinking about the layers of identification because if you're watching the chorus and remembering being a chorus member is that immersive and is it immersive in a completely different way than being in the I mean, you mostly talked about historical plays, but as we know, those were not very common. We tended to have mythological plays instead. So is what levels of immersion are there? It's like, oh, I remember being an actor, or I remember the feeling of immersion as an actor, or I am being immersed in the... So is, yeah, I guess it's a qualitative question as well, but yeah. also thinking about being an actor and, and in Punch Drunk, like maybe part of the thrill is being an actor, not only being in the play as a in the imaginative world of the play. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I've got the examples of the Andromache and Seven Against Thebes. So there are some, some non-historical examples uh, that I, I drew from. There are taxonomies of immersion where people have theories about the different degrees to which you can experience immersion. I'm, I'm less interested in that because it's so bespoke to individual audience members. So I am very much on board with Rose Biggin's view where she says that it's um, an immersive experience is graded. So there are different levels through which you might be immersed. Uh, but I'm, I'm less invested in people who theorize different taxonomies precisely because it's going to be different in different genres of immersion. So I think I've, I've missed over some of the nuance of your question. If you could recap a little bit. Just the idea of if it's true that most of the Athenians had been in a chorus, how does that affect their immersive ability in watching the chorus perform something? Can you say a little more? Sorry, I don't quite. Well, if it's true that like that was a rite of passage, that you would be a chorus member as an Athenian mm. citizen, not an actor, but a chorus member, that was yeah. a training then do you have a different response when you watch the chorus than when you watch the, the main actors? So the example that I gave from Seven Against Thebes was not about the watching a chorus and then feeling like you were reliving the experience of being a chorus member so much, but this idea that in a particular scene you have a war dance being performed that, so it's not just people who were members of the Civic Korea, but actually a much greater portion of the audience would have performed these Pyrrhic dances. Uh, so that was about, for that example, I thought that was a particularly interesting one because it's speaking to a larger demographic of audience and it's uh, playing on those neurons and making them feel as if they could remember those sensations of those moves. The example, the other example was from Andromache. And again, so this was not audience members watching a chorus in this example. This was audience members listening to a messenger speech. And the messenger speech, so there are scholars which argue that all messenger speeches follow an immersive curve in that they're increasingly asking you to turn off what you're looking at. So not focus on the stage, but focus on your imagination. And the Andromache example is interesting because when you're kind of turning off your vision uh, and you're focusing on your imagination, the messenger speech is describing how Neoptolemus is killed through dance imagery. So it's cueing audience members who have firsthand experience to employ those memories when they listen to that messenger speech in a way where if it was just a representation of this murder in myth told um, as a group of assailants uh, attacking um, Neoptolemus. People might not have experience of that. Hopefully you haven't had an experience of a group of assailants coming to you at Delphi and attacking you. And so 
that it might still be a bit immersive if it's following that idea of kind of increasingly swapping vision for imagination, but it might not fully transport you to the alternate reality. And in that example, I was, you know, building um, off other scholars, but saying that this is a case where we have extra things which are working to additionally cue the audience members with relevant experience into making that imaginative leap because they understand the movements that the death is being described through. So I don't know if that kind of answers your question. It's not going to be for everyone in the audience member because you can never guarantee a uniformity of experience, but it's a strategy that Euripides in that instance is employing to try and help support more audience members having that kind of arresting experience. Well, on behalf of the Academy of the Humanities, but also on behalf of this audience here, um, I'd like to thank Emma very much, not only for an amazing lecture, but also for her generosity in answering your probing questions. So please join me in thanking.